invite our first speaker, who is uh, Naomi, who is here to represent Social Enterprise Scotland. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you so much, Sarah, and um, delighted, I have to say, to be here. Um, it's a new platform for us all in terms of navigation, so I'm very pleased I've made it to the right place. First of all, delighted to be able to speak um, and perhaps give a little bit of a context from Social Enterprise Scotland's um, experience and background. Um, over, I guess, the last few months, since really the end of March, middle of March, when all of this crisis kind of hit us. We've been trying to understand the impacts of COVID on our sector and on our members and um, and really looking at that both from conversations with our members, from bits of data and reports that are out there and um, and initially we made conversations and phoned all of our members to find out what was going on. So we produced a report in April with some of the early indications. And on Monday, we actually published our new state of the sector report and the slides when you get uh, sent them, will have a link to that that you can um, click on for more data. We actually um, use the OSCAR survey. So OSCAR recently did a survey out to over 5,000 um, organizations 774 of them were social enterprises have been we've been really working through the statistics of that and also complemented that data set with some calls to some of our uh, kick members community interest company members because obviously they don't fall under the registered charity oscar data so <sighs> I almost hesitate to use the term BC before COVID, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's a bit, um, we used to speak about sector diversity then. We know our sector's incredibly diverse. We've got organisations of um, different staff sizes, turnover sizes. We operate in numerous different sectors. And we also know that within our social enterprises, um, many of them will have um, a different percentage level of trading income. And I guess the fact that our sector is so diverse and so different means that actually the impact of COVID has been incredibly varied on all of our members and how it's affected organisations in our sector has really um, has really been different depending on income sources, depending on activity areas. And so what I wanted to do was pick out a few key themes. I picked out, um, I did a bit of a word cloud, which you can't see in front of you, but there's a few key words that I picked out on that and the first words that I really came across that I wanted to speak about were income and cash flow and um, the lifeblood of all business really chat whether you're a charity a business or a social enterprise and I think what obviously happened as COVID hit is trading income disappeared overnight and if we actually look at some of the data in the recent Oscar survey we can see that um 53% of organisations reported a loss of income from fundraising, but this actually jumps to 70% seeing a loss of income from trading. So for those organisations with a high percentage of trading, it, the impact of COVID was quite acute and quite early on. And I think it's interesting that that challenge then to our sector for many years, we've obviously spoken about trading increasing financial resilience and I think the challenge for COVID is that in this particular situation which no one could predict it's been the re it's been to some degree some of that reverse and I think that's a big challenge for our sector and I want to come back to that a little bit perhaps in looking at moving forwards the next word I wanted to pick up on was around pivot it's probably a word some of us are sick of hearing we've heard it a lot over the the last few months and yet it wasn't really in our vocabulary so much until COVID hit. So we know from our membership that some have started new activities overnight. Some have suddenly had to become a local food distributor. I know in work I'm involved in here where I stay, we've had local organisations suddenly delivering prescriptions, doing activities that they've never had to do before and really focused on meeting direct um, needs from COVID. Some have pivoted their service or business by moving online, whether that's moving online for trading or moving online for um, service delivery. So pivot has again been one of our real key key words of our sector. We've seen a lot of our organisations really shift activity. And then the next word I wanted to pick up on was partnerships. We've heard a lot from conversations with our members that many have talked about new partnerships being developed um, and they could be partnerships with other charities, with other social enterprises, with the local authority, relationships they didn't have before and with the private sector. So that sense of really pooling resources and coming together to meet local challenges, I think, has been a big 
theme um, for many of our organisations. So lots of new connections have been made. And I guess the thing that interests me around that is what does that mean for the future? What does that mean in terms of how people are thinking about commissioning, um, of changed perceptions of our sector? And I think what we've seen in in the last few months is actually the the size of organisation, that the small organisation and that ability to be agile, to be fast moving and to react, balanced against when we need scale and high demand approaches. Our sector show we can do both. And I think COVID's given us a real opportunity to showcase that challenge, challenging as it has been. And I think that the next word I wanted to pick up on on my slide was a, a word around trust. What's been really interesting to me, and it's come up in quite a few of our kind of Wednesday webinars, is we've heard that trust has really changed. That could be trust from funders have suddenly lifted restrictions on what they anticipate organisations said they were delivering. They've restricted reporting or lifted some of the reporting requirements and really placed that trust in organisations to do what was right for their community. Everyone's moved to remote working, or many of us have, so the trust organisations have had a place in their staff has been another huge shift. I think pre-COVID, people were nervous about home working. Thank you, Zara. And, um, and what we've really seen is we now have to trust our staff. And I think, again, that trust from partners and, again, that trust around local relationships local authority working and then the other words i got on my work um cloud that you can't see but one was sector and again it's affected organizations differently we know sport activity for instance has just started we've got social enterprises that were renting space and venues are still unable to open we've got social enterprises operating in tourist areas and we've been looking quite closely at some of the data that social investment business have also put out about consumer spend. And it's interesting that when we look at the Oscar data, many of the responses were actually from sports and arts organisations. And to me, that indicates that they're perhaps still the ones that feel there's some real challenges for them moving ahead. And then what would be my last slide you'd be pleased to hear was um, I pulled up a few of the data um, and put some pie charts together, just looking at um, some of the real impactful data I think from the Oscar survey and I've done it around two themes I always say there's two words in social enterprise social and enterprise so if we look at kind of how this has affected beneficiaries and the, the, the needs of our sector that we're here to service eight percent of our sector has seen an increase in demand on their services in one of our early webinars, we had Cyrenians on talk about their increase in uh, food bank parcels. And I checked the latest stat with them this morning. So since um, prior to COVID, their biggest year, they distributed 1.4 million food parcels. Since COVID through the fair share scheme, that's been 2.4 million. So if you think of that increase on demand on some of those organisations. We also know from the Oscar survey that there's been a 27% noted a severe disruption to services in beneficiaries. So some real challenges that our sector's had to deal with. And then the last bits I just wanted to point out were, were around finance, because we can't forget that, that whole point of cash as the lifeblood again. If we look at the Oscar data, and it will have its limitations, of course, but 90% report a financial threat. 30% of those say that the threat is critical in the next 12 months. That's pretty serious for our sector. And if we look at financial viability, 17% reported a critical threat to their viability in the next 12 months and 35% a large threat. So this is real and it's still there and we've still got significant challenges. So in wrapping up, because I know Zara will be counting me down. <laughs> um, do you have a couple of minutes if you want I to? I do. Thank you, Zara. Thank I'm you. Giving you, obviously, we started a wee bit late, so... Um, so we, we know there's limits to some of the data. I think we always, you know, the people that respond are perhaps going to be the ones that need the help and support the most as well at the moment. Many people are so focused simply on having to deliver and getting through. Um, so we have to kind of remember that when we look at some of the data. But I think we really have to focus on what our organisations are still saying to us as we look at um, the programmes for recovery um, moving forwards and what we as support organisations do next. We need to maximise the relationships that have developed through the crisis um, and we need to continue to listen to what's going on and know. 
And I guess for those people who know me, I feel like I've kind of ended on a bit of a doom and gloom talking about financial threat and critical threat. And I'm generally a pretty upbeat person. So, of course, I can't leave on a negative. And um, I really think that all these challenges aside, what COVID's enabled us to do as a sector is really show how the social enterprise sector can deliver when we've needed to we've stepped up we've reacted and we've we've shown that we've got that ability to change we've utilized the trust and the relationships we have in our communities i think to help local authority partners to help meet what we've needed to do in covid and we really need to build on that moving forwards We've got some tough months ahead. Um, We hope, obviously, um, income streams will start to build for organisations again. I think the challenges now will fall in for those organisations that perhaps had higher reliance on funding as funders have thrown money towards COVID and perhaps local authority budgets um, are also going to be affected. We really need to think about the longer term implications of finance to our sector. But actually, what this has also done on a more positive note is really introduce um, really introduce social enterprise, I think, to our, co- our communities and to consumers a lot more. And actually, if we look at the whole Build Back Better and we look at the environment this has now created, where people want to do something different, how can we as social enterprises really build on that and take that forward? So that was a kind of positive I wanted to try and leave on in what have been quite tough times. And I hope that... Um, leads well into what you were hoping to say as well Josiah. Thank you Naomi I am going to stop this timer because you are a superstar and you finished in time um just I give you guys wrong information I told you that you had to click on the picture to make it bigger it's double click and actually it's not working right now anyway so just bear with us and we'll put a message in the chat when it does um it does kick in and um without further ado I am going to introduce our next speaker um Josiah. Good uh, Good morning, everyone. Um, firstly, thanks to CEIS, as well as Naomi and Pauline, for letting me take part in the conversation today. My role in this session um, is to provide a brief deep dive into the economic data of social enterprises to try and tease out some of the indicators that contributed to both stability and instability across the country over the past few months. To gather this information, we've worked with partners like Datakind, to trawl through the anonymized data of around three and a half thousand third sector organizations across Scotland, including those who engage with the Third Sector Resilience Fund, but also alongside some of the other data collections that went through other interventions. But firstly, it's important to point out that economic data like this does not exist in isolation. We have to understand that it is only valuable when we know when we know not only what it is telling us, but also what it is not telling us, so that we don't try to overclaim and make assumptions um, that we that we're unsure of. In addition, it only paints part of the picture, and has to be understood alongside the experiences and views of people on the ground. This is why presenting this alongside what you've just heard from Naomi and Wilho from Pauline is so valuable. Uh, But for your benefit, I'm going to attempt to present this without just rattling off a bunch of statistics, which I'm known to do. Um, But if you're interested in the detail, um, I'll I'll strive to make those available for for you, either through CIS or Medium or something like that. But with that in mind, what I hope to do is paint a picture of the sector as it looked at the end of March before lockdown. Unpack the key challenges that affected social enterprises' ability to manage the different stages of lockdown and attempt to make some educated guesses about what social enterprises need to consider over the next six to 12 months. When trying to measure the relative stability of an organization at the start of lockdown, we tried to look at the balance of that kind of non-allocated cash on hand uh, relative to an organization's overhead. I wanna make quite, be quite clear that by that, I don't mean unrestricted reserves. Um, Whilst unrestricted reserves paint a certain kind of picture, they're not necessarily a reflection of an organization's cash flow. Um, And as Naomi said, it would really be cash on hand and cash flow that pushes an organization towards insolvency or or some other um, emergency um, place. On that metric, we started to interrogate the data by breaking down the cash position of organizations initially upon geography to see if there was any direct correlation between stability within an urban or a rural setting. But we found quite an even spread of stability and instability across all types of geographies, with the most stable organizations found in places like Aberdeen City, the Scottish Borders and Argyll and Butte, 
and the least stable in places like Dundee and North Lanarkshire. We then turn to look at uh, the same metric across um, size of organization. But sadly, this didn't give any clear indication either. If anything, it showed that the cash flows of organizations with overheads of under 100,000 were slightly more stable than those with a higher turnover. But lastly, we broke down the stats by economic sector. And this is where we started to see some distinct differences. What this showed was that there was a separation between service-based sectors like financial and business services, health and social care or transport, who all appeared relatively stable in March. From those in retail services like food and drink, circular economy, or the creative industries, who all had less cash on hand, as they often rely on high volume of transactions for cash flow. But with that in mind, many of those were approaching the start of their busy season, which would, in normal years, have offset that risk in, in March. But on the whole, it appeared that the majority of social enterprises were approaching the start of ABLE with a relatively normal or stable cash flow, regardless of size, economic sector, or geography, and that the relative stability of an organization was more likely to be down to a specific cocktail of factors it faced rather than one overarching reason. But as we entered lockdown, the trajectories of different types of social enterprise started to diverge. And whilst the information I just presented seems to present a relatively stable image of the sector's cash flow in March, there were still thousands of organizations who were not on a stable footing as the world began to change. By the end of March, all of us were given the news that the country was facing a national lockdown that included the closure of businesses and significant reductions in our ability to interact with other people face to face. With that significant uncertainty and a growing social need, social enterprises face two primary options. To try and react to a growing need in some way that navigates the, their local lockdown restrictions or to go into a relative hibernation. At the time, we didn't know how long or to what extent this would impact our lives and decision-making for just about everybody had to be made with a significant number of unknowns. And it wasn't until two months later that we began to see a roadmap of, to lockdown easing and the ability to start planning a pathway forward. Some organizations were able to navigate the lockdown and adapt and scale up emergency service delivery in their communities across the country through the use of their own resources, as well as from some new funding that was made available. And for those who were unable to deliver frontline emergency services, the data showed that there were three immediate steps taken by most organizations to try to weather that lockdown, either transitioning to a digital service delivery, cutting their costs, or hunting for new sources of funding, each which came with trade-offs to the health of an organization and their ability to achieve the social or environmental outcome it was set up to. One striking theme that came through all the data collected across social enterprises in the wider third sector is how the pandemic affected the income generation for organizations. As we heard from Naomi and we saw in the Oscar and TSI reports, the hardest hit seemed to be commercial trade. And that the people, the organizations hit directly from that were those who rely, the most were those who rely directly or indirectly from a high footfall from Scottish tourism or more people being in the country. For example, hospitality, tourism, retail, museums, many of whom are now hoping for a bumper October to see them through the rest of the year. The lack of footfall for many consumer or tourist, tourist facing enterprises came at the start of the busy season and didn't just make their summer difficult, but also never raises concerns about their ability to weather the quiet season as we approach winter. Organizations with payment by results contracts as well, primarily with public bodies, had mixed difficulties during lockdown with each public body adopting a different approach to contract fulfillment, call, causing some organizations to struggle more than others. Childcare providers in particular were hit very hard by this. The, the other major pressure on organizations were those with buildings, both those who had to pay for usage of a space they couldn't use, as well as those who relied on tenants or room hires and weren't being paid. The period of full lockdown really showed that there was very little an organization could have done prior to COVID to COVID proof their enterprise. And all organizations began progressing at different speeds. But as we entered the phases of lockdown easing, the divergence in recovery and stability began to change and evolved into three primary approaches. And what I would say is that we're probably still at this point on the journey and the situation is moving fast and changing every day. Firstly, we had those organizations 
who remains, and in many cases still remain, in hibernation, waiting for the day that they can reopen the services they were set up to deliver. This could be because they cannot open due to current restrictions, and others, it's because they can't see themselves opening and remaining viable while they're with, with the restrictions they're allowed to do. And the major factors keeping people in this camp often relate to the indoors. For example, offices, theaters, active environments like gyms, or premises that are so small that they can't really get open up with the low numbers that are there. And that includes face-to-face -face service work with service users. Those are still struggling to come back in line. The second group, is those who worked out a temporary solution that allows them to deliver, at least in part, the outcomes and services they had been focused on. It's my own view that the majority of social enterprises are still currently in this camp. Lastly, there's a new group emerging who accepted early on that they weren't going back to pre-COVID and started adapting and investing in their enterprises to become more suitable for the new world. And it is this group that we're starting to see the strongest indications of green roots of recovery. And I would encourage everyone here that's not yet in that place to seriously consider what that perspective would mean for them. But there are a significant number of challenges ahead as we approach autumn. The job retention scheme is ending in less than a month with projected record unemployment. There is a generation of school and university leavers leaving without employment opportunities. Mental health issues have skyrocketed as a result of lockdown. Climate change tipping points are right around the corner. And if I'm gonna be the first person to use the word Brexit at this conference, I apologize that Brexit is coming in just a few months. The challenges are hard, the social issues are growing, but I have to believe that this community of social enterprises can collectively work in partnership to rise to the challenge and lead the way in building back better. Thank you, I'll leave it there for now, but I'm happy to dive into more detail in the Q&A and I'll find a way to get the, the stats out to those who want to do deep dives in data. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you guys. Um, what do you think are the real risks as in within the next three to, three to four months, what are the, the most immediate things you would be asking the people here to uh, be taking action on? Uh, we'll ask um, Josiah and then Naomi. Um, I mean, I, I would say it's the risk of, of, of waiting to make a decision on what to do um, is probably the biggest thing. There are a lot of unknowns and we, you know, we've got risks of future lockdowns or potential things coming. I mean, yesterday, after, like last night at midnight, we had a, um, a partial lockdown in Glasgow that came. Um, but I think the biggest risk is, is those who just keep waiting to figure out what to do. Um, we can wait forever. Eventually, we're going to run out of money for keeping to wait, particularly those who are relying on um, the job retention scheme, which is up now. I think the biggest risk is that we don't start acting, and, and we need to start acting now and moving forward, um, even if we don't know where we'll end up. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. And Naomi, have you got a, a different angle on that, or we'll move to the next question? No, I'm kind of wishing I'd gone first. I, I, yes. The risk to local lockdown, I think, Absolutely. We've, we've already seen that in Aberdeen as well quite quickly. So it's it's very real. I think that sense of obviously we saw some of that debate around using reserves. And um, I guess the thing is, the longer organisations still have to keep using reserves to almost keep the office open is actually does that really limit your opportunity to do what I guess Josiah is saying in terms of could you use them to try and act and change what you do rather than just try to keep the doors and that's a really tough call for organizations but I think is going to require some bold um bold decision making and um and that's pretty pretty tough to do in these situations because we're all still operating in such a mode of uncertainty that never before has our external environment been so unknown to us that whatever move we make we we can't really predict the external environment so um uncertainty i think is going to remain but i would i would echo what josiah said about encouraging organizations to really be bold think about what they're doing because actually we can't all just sit here and wait for 12 months as well absolutely um, so we have a really interesting question from michael cook who has asked what changes from lockdown or the last six months do you think we should be keeping rather than trying to rush back to normal if anyone can remember what normal was so naomi we'll go to you first are there what, what would you keep well we can't deny that climate emergency still sits over 
over everything we do. And um, I think we can see some environmental benefits from less travel. Um, I would look to see how we could lock in some of those environmental benefits moving forwards. I actually, I Going back to my presentation, talking about the partnerships and trust, I would love to see a strengthening of that in the way that commissioning happens, trust in local, and perhaps a move to understanding that we need smaller contractors as well as larger contractors within um, our providers, I think, to give us more of that flexibility and an actual resilience in service delivery, not just financial resilience. So I'd like to lock in some of that appreciation of small is beautiful and um, lock in some of the environmental changes. Great. Uh, Josiah, anything different from you on what you would keep, what lessons have learned? I, I, think, that, I think that's good. I mean, we, when we did the, the data analysis, particularly on the Resilience Fund data, we did a, a linguistic study around um, stuff that people put up really to try to figure out what, what questions people were asking behind what they were saying. So what, people, what were trends across people were saying. And I think people, um, it very interestingly was at the heart. So despite us not, not asking questions and really found about people um, in any specific way, um, everybody seemed to care a lot about people and the mental health. So I think that, that, that shift in focus to not just caring about our communities, but really looking at um, our, our staff and the well-being of everybody that's involved in every footprint. I think the more we can embed that in better, um, it goes without saying that digital in some fashion is is here to stay and, and, and will be there and even kind of more flexible working, outcome-based working, that kind of thing. Um, I suspect that's gonna come anyway, but I think right now is the time that we need to pick out the good and bad of that and try to make sure that what we embed is the good. Because most of us went through this transition without it being a strategic decision, we were forced into it. But now that we have a bit of space, we should think back and try to keep moving in that way, but find the good and not just pull the bad with us that we didn't plan to bring with us. Okay, yeah. Um, and that, that's doing that in a very deliberate deliberate way um, is important. Yeah, Naomi? I think it's interesting that the digital and that approach as we move forward looking at a kind of blended approach in terms of how we deliver. I mean, certainly as a, a national organisation, reaching out to more remote communities has always been quite a challenge. And actually, digital has really opened up the engagement across Scotland a lot more. And again, I think that's something we could really, really build on moving forwards and strengthen our sector in that way as well. I think that's we've seen that at Just Enterprise as well, um, that it's probably not going to go back to completely classroom. We want to look at what do we want people to get out of this and is the best way to do that digital? Is it offline? Is it a combination of both? Is it going to be um, a one off intervention or is it going to be something more sustainable? So just things that before you're, you were kind of like, oh, well, we'll look at that. We'll look at that. And actually now we're all looking at it. Um, I don't know if you guys will have the answer to David Cook's question. David is wondering if we have an estimate of how many business failures there might have been and potentially be among social enterprises. We all knew that the end of the Resilience Fund and furlough was going to be a bit of a cut off. Have we got any uh, information on that or that we can estimate from other sectors? I think it's it's hard to say yes um, to that because it kind of gets pulled into the, the wider stats. So pulling specific social enterprise out will be difficult, largely because we're in the middle of this and, and we, we probably won't see it clearly um, for the next couple of weeks. What I would say is the Oscar study, which Naomi might have in front of her because she was quoting it, um, it showed that about 30% of social enterprises in general, correct me if I'm wrong, Naomi, um, uh, across the country and relatively balanced, depending on geography, slightly higher in some areas, slightly lower in others, are see themselves as being at risk in the next 12 months. Um, and I think when you look at age of organization as well, those between one and three years of age seem to be the highest risk um, within that. So, so trying to kind of see the indicators of who it might be. Um, but it's really hard to see because people are in the process of, of adapting and pivoting and doing these things that a lot of these predictions are not there. Looking at the private sector, what we're seeing isn't as many business closures as, as we expected initially, but what we're seeing is reductions in staff. So big companies are not, say, closing entirely. They're just shutting down a third of what they're doing. 
um, which is a slight different solution because it results in mass unemployment, but not necessarily closure of businesses. And we might want to expand with Oscar data if she has it. Yeah, it, it is um, the 30% um, in the Oscar data set that said they were facing critical threat in the next 12 months. Um, I guess the caveat I always put on data is we know that many of the responses to that data set also a huge, uh, well, a significant proportion were from arts and sports organisations. And of course, you know, the arts sector has been hit quite hard in terms of reopening and sports facilities were also only able to open this week. So I guess we have to be slightly cautious about the data. So, yes, 30 percent is there, but I would just question, I would hope because I am I like to be an optimist. Um, I, I always hope for the best um, is that actually in reality, that figure will end up being slightly less than that because um, we will know that there's some of our organisations out there that, perhaps haven't entered that survey because actually or answered that question because they're not facing the same threat in the same way that perhaps at the time when the survey was conducted, which was May, which we also have to bear in mind when looking at the data, um, that um, other sectors may not be finding the financial threat so top. So just a few caveats around that and a huge dose of optimism for me because we need a little bit of that positive thinking too as well. Thank you. My technical wizards are telling me that someone has two windows open. Um, Naomi or Desire, do either of you have two tabs open on your on your Chrome? Um, if not, then it's obviously another technical thing that I haven't understood. Um, okay, so I don't think we're actually going to get Pauline back, unfortunately, but we will share the information that um, Social Enterprise Network Scotland collected as part of their reset week, and we'll just use the next couple of minutes for questions. So we have got a question, and this might be actually more relevant to your previous roles as entrepreneurs uh, yourself rather than working for support agencies. Jackie Spicer is asking, um, at the moment there, there does seem to be a lot of opportunity and optimism, but then there's also that the tough real, realistic environment we're in and the fact that people like to stick with what we know. So what would your advice be to social enterprises who are torn between thinking this is what we know and this is what we want to do and, and seeing it as an opportunity and how can we approach that to make the, the, the best of both? Who wants to come in first? I can if you want, Josiah. Um, I guess for me, I always go back to getting organisations to think of it from a, a somewhat of a risk perspective and a sense of building on the strengths that you know. So when I've traditionally talked to organisations in the past about looking at business development, I get them to consider it on a kind of looking at either are they looking at business development with new markets, new groups of customers, or are they doing it based on new products and services and understanding where your skills currently lie and how far you're moving away from that in what you want to do next. So the more you diversify from what you currently know, the greater risk to your organisation. So I guess it's always about proceed while understanding what some of the risks are and really don't just necessarily put all your um, thoughts into doing something that actually is very, very new to you because you're almost at startup stage again, not building on what you've got. Thank you. Josiah, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I would only add by saying that we're, you know, the, the sky's the limit right now. Um, we, the stuff we, we thought we knew, we, we no longer know um, in, in many cases now. And so we all, we all have to find a way of um, readapting. I mean, in my, my time, I'm working kind of in detail with you know social enterprises across across the country. I've um I've I've always gone in at a certain stage of evolution of that organization, which the grass market or Gorgi or others. Um and and with those, it was always almost treating it like a startup again, in that we kind of have to go out and figure out what the new questions that people are asking. Um, and I often phrase it in that way of of finding the questions that people are asking, the questions in our communities, the questions in the country, the questions globally, um, and, and kind of being optimistic and trying to find ways of answering those questions, either through services or products or things like that. Um, but I but I would say, you know, we're at that place where we all have to be in a bit of, um, there's, there's, it's very, very unlikely that we're going back to a pre-COVID world um, in any sense of the world. So now moving forward, um, we have to we have to come up with new ways and we have to take risks. Um, and if, if we don't, then um, I think we have less opportunity to even still be around in a year than we did previously. There's so many questions that are pinging to my mind. Uh, John Halliday has asked one, which I think will probably be our final question. Um, and 
I'm going to expand it a little bit. So, so John's question is, um, social enterprises could be seen and supported as a cornerstone of the well-being economy and, you know, obviously support what the Cabinet Secretary was talking about this morning and um, our national performance framework. Are you optimistic that this will happen? And my add-on to that is, how do we communicate that to consumers? Because there are there are consumers who are still clicking on Amazon and, and finding the easy option. So are you optimistic that social enterprise can live up to its potential in the well-being economy and how we, sometimes I feel that we kind of exist in an echo chamber and we're just all talking to people who love social enterprises so how can we get that message out more widely so if we get Josiah to speak first and then Naomi for this last question um no I, I I'm still optimistic that we can take our role but it's on us in, in a lot of ways as a community to to take that role um we need to realize that we are we are a part of the economy um I think that's that's one of the big challenges um and it, it doesn't help that often we're, we're we're lumped in with other parts of you know this different sectors that are there or seeing as part public or not seeing part of business um, but i think particularly looking at the scottish government's response to the benny higgins report where it puts social enterprise named it as a part of what the economy is made up of um, which is one of the first times i've seen it in that explicit ways um, but I think it's now we need to start engaging and taking roles and, and occupying space that wouldn't be normally spaces that private businesses would take. Um, because that means that whether we're looking at it on a community level or on a national level or on an international level, that we're seen as a force within that and we're just assuming that role. We've been pioneering it for 20, 30 years. Um, why, why shouldn't we be doing that? Really? Yeah. I I actually like, I think Martin's put a comment in the, in the chat about um, fear paralyzes and hope mobilizes. So I have to say it's something I would very much go along with as the optimist. This should be our opportunity to really show that we can be an integral part of our communities. We've shown it. We've shown we can deliver. We really need to build on that. And from a consumer perspective, I guess the other thing I'd say is we know we're about to start looking at some um, work focused on um highlighting the role of social enterprise with consumers linking in with the buy social campaign and i think we can do more around that to really get consumers much more aware of what our sector is able to achieve and what we can deliver on but i would encourage your social enterprise to seize the day yeah. seize the day and my thing i always say to people is well how much do you buy from social enterprises and if we could all, whether it's a business purchase or a personal purchase, um, I was really lucky I got a hamper recently from Social Stories Club and it worked really well because I then went and bought loads of the chocolate from the social enterprise because it was so delicious. Um, so we're, we're not going to get Pauline in, obviously, um, and we will try to find a slot for her and or someone else from Social Enterprise Network Scotland if we can throughout the day. Um, I would like to thank you both for your time and your insights today. And if you do have any slides or information that you want us to share, then just send, it, send them to Jo and, and she will do that. And please accept a virtual round of applause in, in lieu of um, an actual one.